Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Here are your hosts, Phil Dark and Ryan North. Welcome back to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast. Today, we're really excited to have Pete Kipley here in with us. Now, Pete is uh, a guy that has, he's got quite the resume. It's a, it's not your, your typical soccer resume, I'm going to tell you that right now, but that's what we're going to hopefully have on this show. Pete is the founder of Bolt to Soccer, which he's going to talk about a little bit later, but he also spent many years in the music industry. He was a producer, songwriter, musician. He wrote some pretty cool songs, won some awards. If you really want to find out more about him, you can look online. We're not going to get into all that today, mainly because Pete really didn't want to, but... <laughs> what we are going to talk about is really what Pete knows about the intersection between soccer, life, leadership, what he's learned in all those things. And so with that, Pete, I'm, I'm really excited for you to be here. I don't know if you're excited Thank as you. I am. I hope you are. I'm very excited. All right, cool. Man, you have got such a good podcast voice. Well, you I'm know, intimidated now. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, it's just years of talking, really, is all it is. <laughs> That's hear. my wife would attest to that so well nothing i haven't practiced that's amazing so we'll see what happens we'll see what happens with that um looking forward to this with that pete we'll get in a little bit about where we met and that later but what i want you to do right now is just share your story of how you got to be where you are today as the founder of bolt to soccer doing yes. training and all kinds of other cool stuff at this uh, soccer facility in the middle of tennessee Thanks. Thanks so much, Phil. I think it, my story started a lot like I think a lot of other parents uh, of kids who play. We've got, we have four kids, two, two of them play. And uh, one of them has all of his mom's DNA. He's absolutely gorgeous boy. <laughs> and I knew, that, I, I knew he, I knew he had some talent there in soccer, but being in a different industry, maybe I didn't quite realize to what level he might find some potential in that sport. And until at that time, somebody did come and watch him play and told us about an opportunity with a club here in Nashville that was just bringing ECNL in into the area. And he felt Miles could benefit from that, which was exciting for him. So we did. We, he tried out for that team and he made that team. And it was, that was just the beginning of the uh, eye-opening experience there for me, mainly hearing coaches implore their players to do a lot of the same things that I was imploring musicians or bands to do, which was just work outside of, of practice. You know, we've got to work on that first touch, first touch, first touch. And I didn't know what first touch was. I knew a lot about <laughs> pocket with drums, those kind of things. But uh, it was fascinating to me, just the level of expectation that those coaches had for these players. And a lot of those coaches had come in from overseas and I think they were used to kids that were taking a lot more touches than maybe the kids were here. But it started that chapter of this life was just trying to understand what they were saying and then seeing a need to facilitate that for some of those players. There just wasn't a facility, a soccer specific training facility in Nashville at that time. And so that kind of started a, like a two year process of going to the conferences, talking to a lot of people, and then uh, eventually finding a space and, and starting off. And so you're really not doing much in the music side right now. Is that right? It's true. I mean, it, it's funny because I think I, I do miss it. I, I, did, I spent so many years doing music, but I always loved it. I, I think for me, it was, again, when I'm looking in this world that I'm immersed in now, and, and you see these coaches and these managers and and the investment that they are making in those players, not just as players, but as humans. And you can see where they have taken that life leadership to a, another level. It, it inspired me a lot yeah. because that's really what we, we were doing in the studio was, yes, we've got to make a great record. We've got to make great greater. But at the same time, here's somebody that's, that's on the road nine months of the year a lot like a professional soccer player or college soccer player. Maybe they're with the same group of people 24 hours a day in a bus. And that was their time to come in and, and just decompress and have an, an objective set of ears, listen to their stories. So it was, it was probably half psychology, yeah. to be frank with you, which I think really translates over into what we're doing now, especially in the day and age that we're in with these young minds and, and going through the year that we've gone through. Absolutely. 
we're going to mine a lot of that in the next few minutes on this interview. But I, I do want to say that we did meet at probably one of your biggest gigs that you ever played at a family camp. You were sitting up on stage playing bass, I believe. It was the bass that week with one of our good Slap friends. Slapping the bass. Yeah, you know, hey, it was not quite a ska band, but you were rocking out back there, I'm not going to lie. And one of our good friends, Luke Brown, was leading the band. I believe he invited you out. And, you know, what really stuck out to me is you were wearing a Man City jersey up on stage. So I knew that I needed to educate you on the finer things of football. But I, I didn't right. let that stop Was me. Was it too tight, Phil? I felt like well, it might have been I mean, a little too tight. That's kind of the European way, isn't it? I mean, that's that's the only way to wear a soccer jersey, I think, if, yeah, you're, no, when you're 50. if you really want to be yeah. legit. But I will say that, you know, it, somebody says, oh, you got to talk to Pete. He's a soccer guy, you know. And so we did. We talked. You were, I think you were out on the field training with your son. He's a keeper. That automatically just, you know, that's my kindred spirit there. And if I remember correctly, he at the time, he wasn't the tallest keeper. That's really my kindred spirit. And so I just, we just connected on that, right? And and that, it's the, hmm. that those conversations we had talking there, talking since then that really did make me say, you know what, I got to get Pete on to talk with folks about this intersection that we talk about with that soccer life hmm. leadership. And with that, I want to talk a little bit about your philosophy at Bolta. On your website, it says that you're, you know, curators, creators, and connectors. Can you can you just talk about that a little bit? What you mean by those? What you're hoping anybody coming to your facility will come away with, and how others Absolutely. can hopefully learn from that. I think I'm going to start back with the very beginning of when we started Bolta. I, I think in my mind it was: is it the nicest turf? Is it the best balls? Is it the great machinery? Is it the satellite trackers? Is it all of the everything and I went down that path with, through a, a bit of naivety at the beginning thinking that would impress people and very very quickly realized the human element in, in this I mean it's a ball it's a few cones and a great trainer mm -hmm. you know somebody that can invest in, in not just that one session but the many years that lead up to whatever it is you want to accomplish as a player and to me, I realized that this is a good opportunity. I feel like soccer is growing very fast. We, we, we have a new MLS team in our town. First year, they're doing amazing. Very proud of them. But as you well know, like soccer up until maybe this year where everything's been put a little bit on pause has become such a, a viable sport option, I mean, particularly for girls here in the States, but for a lot of guys too that you're seeing. And now I think we've got what, 11, 11 U.S. men players that are playing on Champions League teams in Europe now, that's going to greatly improve our chances, not only at just getting in <laughs> this year to the World Cup, but doing well, having those players perform at those levels and then bringing that back to, to th this experience here. But and as I started just meeting more and more uh, kids, more and more parents, coaches, uh, players, I realize that this is not a company that we're building. This is a culture that we're building. This is, and, and culture is, is so important, especially when you're melding the minds and how the mind and the heart and the body work with young players. And to me, it was, I just had hoped to be able to find like-minded people. I don't actually do the training. I, I curate the trainers. And I feel like in our neck of the woods, I, I couldn't be happier with the trainers that we have. I feel like they're the best, but it's just a good culture. And that we really experienced that during this pandemic where all of a sudden you've got to, we've got to shut down. Hey, the, it's, it's mandated. So that means we had to shut down. And, and that's where we, we started. I feel like the cloth in our fabric just began to get a lot stronger and finding people that see themselves and the players that they train and don't just look at this as how can I get through 60 minutes as quick as I can. Yep. So that's what we're doing on the curation side. On the creation side, what, what we're trying to do is create more opportunities for players, whether they're coming in from overseas or if they're coming in from regionally, to be able to perform in front of, whether it's coaches at USL clubs or MLS clubs or at colleges, trying to create opportunities. So instead of just having a, hey, we've got by five, 60 minute sessions in a package, but what we're really trying to do is focus that programming into, hey, 
where do you fit and what we might be able to do for you in the future. So just trying to create opportunities. And that's the focus that I have there at Bolta. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I was really just impressed with those three things and also talking about the connectors, which I think goes to something else you talked about earlier today in this conversation with the idea of how you got in the music industry is very similar to how you're seeing the kids are getting into the soccer Yes. The, not business, but the idea of college, the idea of pros, the idea of getting to the that next level, whatever it is. You have the next level of music. You have the next level of business. You have the next level of whatever it is. So what are those parallel things that you've seen as you learn that our kids can learn from, but also people that are coming out of college, people that are coming into the real world, so to speak. Hopefully you all know what I mean by that. Obviously the soccer pitch is the real world, but to go into the <laughs> business right. world, to be able to take this, what we're learning to that life, those life lessons. Yeah. I remember when I was dreaming about getting into the music industry as a producer over several years. And again, the similarities are, they're just uncanny. You've got to do the work. You've got to continue to get better at your craft, whether that's your instrument or whether that's writing. I believe that songwriting, you use a muscle to do that. And you've got to keep that thing fit to be able to make sure that you're producing the best that you can on average there. But you know, what really helped me at the beginning was finding mentors, finding people that saw something in me and, and decided to make an investment. And, and that's what got me to Nashville was a couple guys that were here that were doing it that felt like there was some, pot some potential there for me. And I'll never forget these guys for the rest of my life. So they were like coaches, mentors, friends. The same thing here in what we're doing with soccer is trying to identify those players that we feel like we can really assist in going to the next level. And, and a lot of that boils down to the philosophy that yes, we want everybody to be engaged and love the sport. You've got to love it to want to stay in it, but you will see a few players that you can tell have got that potential to go to that next level. And I feel like, especially now with COVID and, and you're looking at the dead period for recruiting continually being extended. And then these girls, maybe they're sophomore, junior, seniors, that are used to having a social high school soccer experience are stuck at home with their moms and maybe brothers and sisters and they can't go out. It's, I feel like a lot of these players are wondering, am I even going to go to college? Will there be college? It's a whole lot for a, for a, a young player to deal with from the mentality standpoint. So for me and, and our crew are like, even tonight is the di district finals here in Franklin for the girls. And, and we go to these games because the, I know they love to feel the support mm -hmm. and they love to see, hey, I just trained with Andrew Saturday and he's here to come and watch and go on that extra mile to, to just be sure that, that these kids mentally, emotionally, as well as physically are able to perform at the levels they need to yeah. for right now. Absolutely. And what I've tried to talk about with my kids is use these experiences that you have with the coaches as you're getting recruited, as you're having conversations, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a, a visit, whatever it may be, this is what it's going to be like in the future. Use this to practice for your future interviews for jobs, to also know how to evaluate whether you want to work for someone as you're looking at schools. Do you really want to play for this coach? And from the coach's yes. side, and really from that leadership side too, I think something you said really stuck out to me was, and I just think back to my different interviews when I was looking at coming out of law school, looking at the law firms, or just talking to different people and doing the hiring side, that if the people aren't really talking about their culture, if they're not really talking about why you, basically you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you, and from that other side of it, from that hiring side, right, from that coach's yes. side, the only coaches, there were a few coaches that I, and I'm not going to name any names at this point, but I will give you a hint that they're likely going to be on this show at some point, that my daughter, when That's she right. was being recruited, that I said, I would be okay with you playing for them. Each one of them mm. said, who you are as a person as as important, if not more important, than who you are as a player. Absolutely. And, and they meant it. You could tell they meant it. They weren't just saying mm -hmm. it as part of the pitch because they had examples. And I think that's really important for us to remember too. And so I, I, what do you think about that? Have you seen that in the conversations? Uh, no, absolutely. 
Yeah, and I think you bring up a very, very helpful point, not only for parents that are walking their kids through that process, but, but more importantly for, those, for the kids themselves. When you were saying, hey, use this time to practice. When you're in that, especially now, so now it, everything is almost like backlogged and, and jammed. I mean, coaches haven't been able to come out to games, haven't been able to come out to showcases. They're really dependent on guys like us, helping them uh, navigate the talent pool regionally and sending video, 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 video. But as these girls and, and, and boys too, but as you're talking to coaches, it, it, it's, I think it's very nerve wracking that first telephone call because you don't really know what to say and you're nervous and maybe you don't know the, the right questions to ask, but th then maybe the next call goes a little better. And then maybe you text the coach and, and, you, and you get to have the communication again. And I think it's understanding that, hey, this is just as much a part of my training as actually training, mm -hmm. is learning how to have a conversation, how to speak with an adult, and then understanding those bullet points of what it is that you're looking for and, and navigating. The number one thing you've got to do when you're looking at a school is make sure that school is going to be the best for the rest of your right. life. N not just that you'll get a starting spot your freshman year and then, wait a minute, I want to be a doctor. Why am I going to the, I don't know, the auto mechanic school? Or I want to be an engineer. Why am I going to uh, the medical school? You know, finding out those schools, narrowing them down into what you want to ultimately become. Because even if you make it to the next level of soccer beyond college, there's still a gigantic piece of life waiting for you at the end. Maybe you'll want to work into coaching or something, but odds are there's something else inside of you that needs to come out as well. So I think finding that school, and then you're right, uh, it has to boil down to culture. And sometimes I think that you'll get a sales pitch from a sure. coach and it's gonna be this way, this way, and then you go, it's, well, it wasn't that way. But understanding that, hey, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing, I'm becoming a part of a team, uh, and a team has, is more than just me. I, I've gotta be sure that I can the, relate with the coaches. And then I, I think f narrowing those things down is going to be extremely helpful. This is kind of a side note, but I will remember when I was one of the best pieces of advice I ever received when it came to choosing a job or even when I was looking at law schools, the people said, interview, not officially, but interview the administration and talk with them about their experience. Because you know what? They know everybody as well as anybody. So like the receptionist, for instance. Talk to the reception. They know the culture and they'll talk because you're out in the lobby for 10, 15 minutes. So when you're going to interviews, when you're going on recruiting visits, when you're going, don't just focus on the players and the coaches, which are important, but talk to other people who are around the, and say, is this legit? Is this real? Yes. And they'll know and they'll tell. Do you like it here? And you'll be able to tell. And so those are things that I think are just important for life to be able to understand what that looks like. And I can tell you watching my daughter on those calls that I, I just had these flashbacks there's a little PTSD I'm not gonna lie because it was painful <laughs> watching her on some of those initial calls but you know what she did sure. get better now she's still not super comfortable because it's partly personality as well certain personalities will have mm -hmm. no problem they'll just go do it no no big deal other ones are gonna struggle more with it but she got a lot better more comfortable because she realized what if it's a good call or a bad call you hang up and life goes on and that's just the same for anything that you're doing, right? We put all this pressure right. on ourselves. And at the end of the day, it's like, wait a sec, that wasn't that big of a deal. The other thing I just, it was interesting to me is when you're talking about the, the curation and the curating coaches, it just made me laugh that you're just a producer in a different arena, right? That's basically Maybe. what you're doing. I mean, very similar, right? You're very similar. It's, you know, just bringing that yeah. band together and yeah. You're just bringing the talent, the best people, and you know what you're best at and what you're not best at. And I think that's a big part of leadership as well, right? You know what you're, what you're good at, what your areas is, but you want to bring in people better than you and the things that are really important. All right, so let's move on to one of the other things we wanted to talk about. I want to hear what you're learning and what you're seeing about the game because, as you said, you're not this lifelong soccer dude. It's not like you grew up like I did, you know, age four to pretty much 46, just being a part of the game and it being a part of me. You're coming in with your kids from the outside, learning about it, and there's such a value to hear that, what you're learning, what you're seeing. And I just want to hear from you what you're learning about the game, what you're learning about all of this, particularly as it relates to the mental side of the game. But what have you been seeing and learning? Wow, gosh, you kind of closed that with the, with the highlight. 
I, I will back up and I, I really want to spend a lot of time talking about that piece because I, I think as you're looking at breaking down a player, and again, it's not rocket science. We're not going to be working with a nine or 10 year old the same way we're going to be working with a 21 year old pro or a 15 or 16 year old with lots of potential to do one or the other. You know, but you're focusing on technique, 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 you know, first touch, first touch for sure. And, and, and then, yeah, let's, let's work. The, the thing that I love so much about the trainers that we have is they come at it, they are, have been able to marry that technique and that tactical piece better than I, I've ever seen. Because really, when you have a coach and you're playing at high level, you're expected to have the technique, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so you've got somebody that's responsible for speed and agility, for your fitness, and then a coach kind of needs to be focusing on tactics. Yep on, okay, what are the combinations that work? What are the packages I can send out? What do I do in this situation? Who's the next team I'm playing? That's where their, their focus has gotta be there as opposed to, wow, we've gotta send this kid off to get a better, you need to have the, the first touch there. But working on mentality, what was definitely maybe number four in those pillars, mm -hmm. if you have technique, tactical, fitness, speed, and agility, and then mentality, and maybe four was way over here to the right, it was a long number four, where now it's a completely solid number one, mm. because you're just dealing with so many more issues than we were dealing with last year, or, or players that were, I think anytime you have a global pandemic, it's gonna flip a lot of things around. But it was just, incredibly uh, upsetting and challenging to, to see players coming in with long faces because wow I'm, I'm sure that the tryout process was the same in California as it was here it was no contact mm. so if you're a defender you're not really going to be able to show your best qualities if they're running one drill that makes a striker and a keeper look good right yep. you know and boy I sure hope my center back can put in a good cross well they're used to defending crosses more than putting them in right so just a lot of those kind of, of pressures, but my main concern isn't what's happening with them today or tomorrow or this week. It's what's going to be happening with them in three years, five years, based on what these kids have gone through. And you add to that the pressures that maybe some parents will put on those kids, which is something I really feel like we need to talk about. And on top of the pressures that they have for themselves and trying to reacclimate to society because they you can't really go to football games, can't really go to a prom, you know, it's like, okay, we've got to work in these small groups. So really focusing on making sure that we're communicating with like, how are you? We're building that trust. And I think for us, we've done a, a, a good job of having guys and girls that are just unbelievable trainers. Because I think a lot of times it's good to have somebody that, wow, you're playing pro right now. I want to play pro. But having them say, hey, how are you doing? Like, really? How are things at home? How are things with, with your teammates or your friends? And just breaking it down to uh, the bare bones of communication with these kids and making sure that we're looking out for them mentally yep. as the priority. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's so huge for parents to hear, for coaches to hear, for I think also business leaders to hear, for teachers to hear, for people who are impacting anybody that's under you. I think as a leader, you need to hear that very clearly. That you need to, I think it also is important to study the individual as well and to know how they react to different stimulation, to different encouragement, to different yes. things that are part of what they are talking about here. So I think that is, those are all critical aspects of just, I think life is to know who you're talking to, to know what that impact of your words and your actions and your tone will have on them. And so with that, I think what you talked about and something that we don't really need to go into a lot of detail and give a lot of examples of it, because I think anybody who's been around youth sports at all has seen parents that are micromanaging, parents that are pressuring. And sometimes it's healthy and sometimes it's really unhealthy. And as far as I say pressuring and micromanaging, I, I don't know many times that's healthy, but there are times where the encouragement and certain kids will be encouraged and inspired in different ways than others. So to look at one and say that's wrong may not be having the whole story. But with that, what have you seen with that? What are your 
and I would say bring in your experiences in the music industry as well to talk about really how have you seen that impact the players, the musicians, whatever, and what would you encourage people to do to hopefully make that so it's not really as much of an issue in the future? Yeah, I think that's where the rubber meets the road right there is that parent-athlete relationship. And I'm happy that I get to speak from both sides Mm -hmm. of that coin. A lot of our trainers are late twenties. They don't have kids yet, so they don't quite understand what, you know, but they definitely had parents. And it it was funny because even the trainers that we have, uh, a half of them had the right kind of soccer parent and the, the other half had an aggressive soccer parent. But for me, I think I made a whole lot of mistakes at the very beginning. I'm a positive person to start with. I, I definitely have such a hard time hearing parents that are putting that added pressure on their kids as opposed to keeping things positive. And number one, just learning to trust the process. In youth soccer, it's almost every club says, hey, parents, trust the process. For, for sure, you'll see the, those kids that maybe they you know, put a ball in, maybe they missed the shot. And, and, and instead of, you're gonna miss shots. You take shots, you miss shots. And, and if you watch a high level professional take a shot and miss, usually the look on their face is a smile. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, yeah. we all know I should have made that. I know I should have made it. The coach knows it, right. the teammates know it. Okay, I'll, I'll make the next one. When a lot of times what we see are kids that when they miss that shot, the first thing they do is immediately turn to where the parents are and, and see if their mom and dad saw it. They don't look at the coach or the team. That's the first thing that they do because they know it's going to be a long ride home maybe for just missing a shot. I think there's such a fine line in parenting and being a fan. And then as a parent, creating opportunity, maybe encouragement to, hey, you know, if this is something you want to do, I'd recommend that you go work with this guy or work with this girl, or maybe we should look to go to this club. But that's where it needs to end right there in that relationship because what happens with the kids is all of a sudden they're feeling like their worth to a parent is based on a performance on a field, Mm. which is just planting the wrong seed instantly. Their worth has nothing to do. I mean, Miles, if he misses an easy save, we forgot about it the next week for sure. But that cannot be what he feels like secures his value with me as a dad. And for us, and I have a feeling you were the same way, we don't talk about soccer ever, ever, unless he brings it up. Like sometimes there'll be a, a, a bad game, whatever, maybe 10 minutes down the road, he'll say, I, I can't believe this, which I love. I love it when he talks about it with me. Yeah. But there's no way that he could take it if, if I was like, hey, what happened there in the, in the 15th minute? That's an easy save for you. You see, he already knows it. Right. He's already beat up about it. What he needs to hear me say is, hey, I'm proud of you. And I do hope for him and really for everybody, I hope they're giving their best effort, but, but they're gonna make mistakes just like we do. Yeah. And, that's, and you learn from the mistakes and Absolutely. try to create that opportunity. But we have, I can think of one, one girl in particular who's, whose mom is just a little too much. And it scared me to the point where she's texting the coach, really not supposed to be communicating with the coach. The coach needs to communicate with the player. Mm-hmm. But when she would come in even to watch the, the training sessions, I'd notice that the, the, the player's level would drop probably 50%. That's like, hmm, this is very interesting because she's at such a high level here. But then when this shows up, it, it, it drops down. And I think for me, my encouragement, I, I love giving, giving talks to clubs and especially on behalf of parents and saying, hey, you really do need to trust the process. Not every club is perfect. Not every team is or coach is great you've got you know that's great not so great but you've at least got to trust the process that they know what they're doing hey just encourage your kid yeah it's not rocket science no absolutely and i think there's so much there that could be like half a season of episodes on what Hmm. you just talked about there but i I think one of the things I, i really draw out of that is that idea of a freedom to fail and to be able to know that. And I think that goes from the the soccer field to life. I think that goes to, as a parent, they need to understand that you love them. Their identity is not in soccer. It's not in grades. It's not in anything. It's in, they are your child. They are in my worldview and yours. It's, they're a child of God. That's their identity. 
and they can play. If they're loving playing, keep playing. If you can make it to that next level, as you said, if they ask you for that advice, like for me, my kids ask me more because they know that I'm a coach. They know that I know these different things. So they do ask me and I will give them because I ask them, Are you, do you want, the, you want the coach or you want the dad? And depending on the moment, they'll say different things. Ultimately, it's the dad, always. Hmm. But after a game, I help coach. I'm the assistant. On my, I was on my daughter's team. Never the head coach of her. But for good reason. We'll get, we can get into that later. But when she asked, we talked about it. And she knew that when she did had a phenomenal game, I talked to her about that. And we told her when she didn't. We talked about the things that she already knew she could have done better, but I didn't bring it up in those different ways because as you said, here's the thing. It was my wife and I, my wife played D1 soccer. I went to school to play. We we have that in our part of our family. And Mm. so we have this saying in our house that when you shank a shot, you don't need everyone to tell you you shank the shot. You know you shank the shot. And that's basically what you just said, right? I mean, I've seen Wayne Rooney hit it up in the upper deck. I've seen him take a shot and it go out of bounds. It was so far to the right. And those are the realities of life too, is you have those moments where you do shank the shot. And if you have everyone piling on you about how you shank that shot, whether in whatever area of life, it's not helping. In fact, it makes your performance suffer in the future. And so I just want to hear on that idea, that concept, really how you saw that how you saw that come out in your time in the music industry. I mean, did you see that same thing with the musicians or a similar thing? Absolutely. You know, it's funny because in in that world, shoot, you you can have a hundred chances and nobody sees it. Mm -hmm. Nobody hears the flat note. Nobody knows when you missed the fill or or you didn't read your chart right because you just hit stop, rewind, record, and you just get it till it's right. And obviously that's not the way it works in sports as much as we wish it would. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, we can't take a mulligan because I missed the shot or I put in a a bad cross or I I should have parried that goal over instead of putting it right back in. So there is a little bit more pressure there, I think, on where it relates to the athlete because I, I feel like, shoot, musicians, imagine this. Imagine if you're really kind of playing the same team, you know, 60, 90 times a year with the exact same lineup. I mean, you kind of just get it down and and boom, you're in. Not really suffering on the, I guess some bands can have bad nights, but it's much easier to fly by, I think, in that music realm where as technology changed, it's interesting. I feel like one thing that's opposite and not for everybody, but as technology changed and it became so much easier to fix issues through a computer than having to just get it right the first time. Um, th- th- that became a little bit frustrating because, you know, you do want, even, even at Bolta, you know, I, I want that product to be at a 10 every time, every session. So, hey, listen, if you're onto your third session as a trainer and wow, you don't feel like you can bring that full hour value or 90, depending on what it is, you just gotta let me know and then we'll bring this other trainer over. It's okay to say, hey, I'm not gonna be at my 10, but that's another piece of the pressure for the players. I feel like they, they feel like they've gotta be at a 10 and good for them when they are. For us, especially in our training philosophy, we, we want you to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. I mean, make the mistake, make the mistake, but we also want you to be engaged and quick to learn to understand that that's the mistake and then okay this is how I begin to correct it so if we're working on somebody getting a left foot that we're not going to be able to fix that in 15 minutes you know that's going to take a long time but if it's those tiny mistakes whether it's your positioning or, or your touch especially being able to understand hey I blew it a bad touch that's right okay we've got to fix it and clean it up and that's another thing too, is we really work, we love working in groups as opposed to individuals, mainly because it's not an individual sport. You're playing with other people and the sessions are able to move faster and, and have more energy. But sometimes somebody you're training with is gonna give you a bad ball. And then you don't have your touch, you don't make your shot and the trainer's chewing you out. And they're complaining, hey, he didn't give me, she didn't give me a good ball. Well. <laughs> That is so much like life, isn't it? I mean, how many times do we get teed up with a good ball in life? (laughs) But it's that thing. It's understanding, okay, how do I respond to a bad ball? Okay, I'm going to have to learn how to fix that. 
and, and then not say anything because odds are you're going to give a bad ball to somebody in the next play. Absolutely. That's funny you say that, man. Like I remember back when I was teaching a course at university and I, I assigned group projects and never fail. Every time I assigned a group project, I'd get people complaining left and right about it because they knew they were going to be the one ending up doing everything. Hmm. And what I told them, though, during that, I said, here's the deal. This is life. This is how life works. The vast majority of your jobs are going to be group projects at some point. That's right. And there will be times where you get handed, as you said, garbage right? That's the part that the three other people, and I've seen my kids do group projects. I've seen other people do projects. I've done group projects and it happens virtually every time. And my daughter's like, dad, every time I'm always doing, I said, you know what? Do it with everything you got, because you know what? At the end of the day, your teacher doesn't care who did what, but if you want a good grade, you (laughs) got to do it. And so in soccer, when that bad ball comes, you better make the most of that bad ball. When I was a lawyer, I'd get stuff put on my desk that was terrible writing. Just awful. I'm going, how do these people pass law school? I have no idea. But when I gave it to the next partner who was in line, he didn't care what came on my desk. He cared what I put on his desk. And those are the realities of of life. But when you're on a team, it's your team performance that's going to do it. Anyway, those are things that I saw. So any thoughts on that? I mean, that's what makes me smile, especially in a game setting when you're familiar with a player and what their abilities are. When you see them handle a situation, especially when we're talking about putting balls in, I mean, it's going to happen. They're going to miss you. But finding those players that that are able to quickly adjust, it's going to be so helpful, I think, in life. You know, I think for us, it's any given day, the life of an adult, when you've got kids and you've got your wife and business and not everything's going to go perfect, but finding that way to say, okay, I got to fix this and then push through. And and like you said, do the very best that you can with it. But... I feel like that's so much a part of becoming a player and understanding, especially as you're growing and proceeding. Coaches will always tell you it's about finding that space, creating that space, coming into support. And it all works hand in hand. I mean, if you see somebody that's given you a, a, a ball, maybe they've been under pressure, it helps you understand, okay, I'm going to help this guy out. I'm going to take a good touch and, and move through. But I think finding, oh, man, again, the parallels. They, they are so funny with, with soccer and life, yep. you know, like finding that, that way to, yeah, okay, I need to cover up for this guy. I need to help my wife out with this. Right. But a lot of times we need the help too. That's right. And it's just kind of nice to know that, wow, they got my back. That's awesome. Exactly. That's when you see the well-oiled machine teams out there who are playing together. And it's like clockwork. If someone gets out of position, someone's covering them. And the teams that get burned are the ones that, people think they're too important or they're they're this or they're that and you get the prima donnas and they're not going to cover for someone and then the whole it's a weak link sport you're going to be as as strong as your weakest link and and so those are all things that you know we'll talk more and more about on this show and not to get you back on we got we got a lot more we can talk about but we are coming towards the end of our time together but uh, i do want to talk about a couple more things one of the thing is the What are some of the qualities of the best coaches that have come through your clinic or who you have seen coach your kids that you've experienced? What are some of those qualities that are the common threads amongst those coaches? I think you can even see it in coaches that you don't know personally. Like, for instance, let's take Jurgen Klopp. Okay, for some reason, there's, he has found this way to lead kids that are a little bit more difficult to lead than we were mm-hmm. maybe you know, you yeah, know what I'm saying? like some of the, the millennial kids and, and the way that they communicate you'll see other coaches that that just they fall out it's because they're not able to adapt to the way we've got to learn how these kids communicate yeah. otherwise it literally sounds like we're speaking in a different language but that's okay that's just the way that life works but you're looking at these kids now, and I think you bring up a, a great point by what you said there in that last segment. We really work hard on perception, both as trainers and as players. And I want to touch on that as it relates to the qualities that I like to see in coaches and, and trainers. But even as it relates to the player, in situations like tryouts or, or ID camps, a coach is going to notice how you react to the outcome of the situation. And if they see you just pounding the pitch or screaming, or ripping your head off, they're not really gonna wanna bring that player 
to their team. Yeah. It's like that, that reaction. And okay, yeah, you'll notice if, if you're working with a seven-year-old team, if they lose, what do they do? They all just start crying and, until they get their juice box and their little fruity fruits right. and then everything's fine again. But helping people to understand how to take control of their reactions and take control of those emotions. And you know what? It, it, it's funny. If, if you watch any of the top players come out on a Sunday morning or Champions League game, whatever it is, the thing I notice is a, a lot of them have the same expression on their face when they walk onto the pitch as they do when they walk off. It's the same expression, whether they won or whether they lost. It's, hey, they had a job to do. They understand that this is a responsibility. And by working yourself up emotionally, it's not going to uh, really impress anybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I feel that for these kids too, and uh, maybe, maybe more especially for the kids trying to come to that balance of the pressure that they're putting on themselves, the pressure that they're feeling from their teammates and their coaches, and then that trying to balance that pressure that they're feeling from the parents, yeah. which again, it, it's always going to come back to that. And I don't know if, if you notice this, but y your kid will never listen to you. That's just a rule. That's the way it once is. Once they hit about 12. It, I think once they hit 12, <laughs> it's all over. Exactly. Right. If you tell them, hey, listen, I feel like maybe you should be up off the balls of your feet. It's no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And then the very next day the coach says, hey, I need you up <laughs> off the balls of your feet. They're like, yes, sir, yes, sir. Right. So I, was, I feel like the quicker that we can come to that realization as parents, the better. I feel like with the trainers, when you're looking for those qualities, it, this isn't a, a fast food industry. These are kids that, okay, wow. We love it when we, we see young players that are, you can't even tell what foot they are because they're just executing both sides so freely. And, and those kids are, are the easiest ones. But I, I feel like looking at that, t taking that kid into account as to, okay, where's this kid come from? And where does this kid want, want to ultimately go? And finding that way to build that trust. A lot of times on, on first sessions, kids will be scared to come because they're afraid that they're going to get yelled at or I did this wrong. But finding those ways to present yourself as somebody that can be trusted as an adult, because that's what we are. We're adults if we're coaches, if we're trainers. Right. The coaches that, to me, it's, it's a fine line. And you're going to see, uh, watch any of the, the shows, and you see the, the coaches screaming their heads off in the locker room. It's a little bit of a part of the job. But it's like anything else. It's that balance of realizing, wait a minute. It, it, am I going to be that coach that looks at, at a player as a commodity, as just somebody to help me get through a season? Or, or am I going to look at this player as somebody that I could have in my life for the rest of my life? And I don't think every relationship works out that way, but so many of the great players and every one of our trainers has a story of that one coach. Yeah. You know, that one coach that for some of them, maybe it was younger, some of them, maybe it was college. We're very, very fortunate in Nashville. I feel like the college coaches here, particularly on the girls' side, are just off the chart. They get it. They get the full experience, and you'll hear this from all the girls. It's like, yeah, I'd, I'd love playing for him, or I love playing for her, because I know that they're more invested in me as a human and as somebody that can have an impact on, on this world more than as a player that can only have an impact on a game yeah. that we're all going to forget about in two, two weeks, two months. Yep. I love that. I, I love the idea about, and whether it goes to parents talking to coaches and having them communicate a message, whether it's coaches understanding that they may not be the best person to connect with a particular player as well. We just had Paul Jobson on, head coach of Baylor women's soccer. Love him. He's awesome. The His difference. wife is ridiculous. Yeah, player yeah she. As well. well, my wife, I, as I said on the show with her, my wife was the chaplain for the Atlanta Beat when Marcy was playing for the Beat, and it was. Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. It was a blast. She's awesome, but, but we we talked about it on there too. The idea that there's some players that he doesn't connect as well with as some of his assistants and in law firms in businesses in organizations whatever it is there may be some people that connect better with others and for you as a leader to know that to be able to say hey here's the message we want to get across to them can you connect with them and make sure that they understand that whatever it may be so I think that goes at really every level and that goes to relationships as well that there's certain things that will be communicated better by one 
more than another. So with that, that's something that actually leads into the next question. Are there things that, you know, maybe one or two things that in your house you use the principles of soccer to help you to parent, help you in your marriage that you could help others with out there? You know, to me, I think I, I lived such a create your own rules kind of life out there in the music business for sure. And in some ways it's still similar now, but what I love about soccer is the law and the rules of the game and the respect for it. And when a ball completely crosses the line, that ball is out and that, and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's not, maybe it stayed in or like, like so much of life can be where it's easier to bend those rules and, I love the order of soccer. I love the order and just the philosophies, the methodologies as you're progressing through the sport. That's helped me just a whole lot as a dad, as a husband, hopefully realizing, wait, I just need to put more order here. These are the hours that I'm going to be here yeah. with the family or, or wow, that garage is looking a little bit messy. That would never, ever fly with Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> I promise you, he wants your locker clean. Right. And to me, the, the beauty of it, it, so our facility, <laughs> our facility is one of two facilities right where the, the two major interstates meet in Nashville. So it's a beautiful skyline, but the facility across from us is the Adventure Science Center, which is where you go yeah. and you learn about stars. And it's really, it's world-class here in town, but it's so interesting to me how similar a, a ball flying through the air is exactly like life because you could have the same ball being kicked onto a different pitch and it's going to bounce the complete different way but it's learning to adapt to this spinning just beautiful object that is going to be a blessing or a curse depending on what net it goes into you know i don't know i, I love i love the beauty of of this sport and I don't know. I, it's hard for me to find people that aren't beautiful people like you that, that don't love soccer. It's, maybe it's that whole kind of outlook on life. We went a lot more philosophical on that one than I expected to. I'm not going to lie. That was fantastic. That was just, we went science center. We went like, you're, you're like waxing right there. You're waxing philosophy going on. That was sweet. Well, that was, no, that's great. I love it. I love it. And that's what you can tell is that they call it the beautiful game for a reason. I think it's part of it on the field. Yes. But I think also just how it impacts people and how it really is a way that you can communicate with people all around the world, which is part of the reason we're doing this show is to be able to help you to communicate it with your kids, communicate it with others and communicate it with anybody that you're dealing with. So Last question. I, I just want to hear from you if you have any books or movies or podcasts, other resources that have really impacted your thinking on what we're talking about on the show, how soccer, leadership, or both can help us to flourish. Yeah, I, I definitely got maybe a little over immersed in the whole watching every single soccer <laughs> game and every single show about it. I, I love watching those behind the scenes yeah. shows that, that are on Prime, starting with City and then Tottenham. I'm, I'm not sure how ultimately realistic those interactions yeah. are, but, but still, it's a lot of fun to be able to see that, again, you know, tie that human element in. And if you're looking for something to watch about soccer, just get on Prime. The, the last two seasons with the Leeds United yeah, story, who that team is, it's just fantastic. But I think even learning the lessons from, they're so fortunate with the coach they were able to bring mm -hmm. in. And then even through disappointment of not being promoted in that first year, the fact that he stayed, I will forever be a giant fan. Yeah. Absolutely. I will, I will cry when he moves on to the next soccer life, wherever that is, because that's the measure of a man. And you know, every one of those players said, we're bringing this. That's right. We're bringing this next year. And it's just, it's a lot of fun to, to see them experiencing, even through COVID, what they're experiencing. But they're a really easy I'd team say, to like. They're a really easy team to like and to be a fan of. A good friend of mine, hopefully he'll be on the show here in the future. A big Leeds fan. He lives in Leeds. So I've been, don't tell anybody. I mean, I, there's, you know, going to be, other than all the people who are listening. But, you know, as a United fan, I'm not supposed to like Leeds. <laughs> but as you said, it's hard not to like them right now, given what they've been through. Now, when they play United, I'm not going not gonna to be a big fan. However, sure. uh, every other game, I'm like, man, these guys, not only are they fun to watch, but like you said, watching that on Prime, but also following it with my buddy 
it's just been a lot of fun to follow them and their story. And I think a lot of these lessons we're talking about, you can learn from those things. One show, have you have so you too. watched? It reminded me of it when you talked about finding the right person to communicate a particular message. Have you been watching the Ted Lasso show at all? <laughs> You've got to watch it if you haven't oh watched gosh. it. I mean, I, I, you know, the first two episodes, I'm like, well, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure. But then after that, it was... It is, it, it is amazing. Guys, if you haven't watched the Ted Lasso show, watch it. It's on Apple TV immediately. It's fantastic. I will say, just as a disclaimer, there is language. It's a British. It's got a lot of British stuff going on. So there's you know a lot of F-bombs, a lot of language. So younger kids, probably not for them. But, but even some of the older kids, depending on, on that, I just want to make sure you understand that. However, there was a, a scene, I'm not going to ruin it, not a big spoiler, but there's this Nate who's the equipment guy. And a big, tons of leadership lessons. I think we're going to do an entire episode on the leadership lessons of Ted Lasso. I'll have to get you back on it for that one. But one of the things he brings in Nate, this equipment guy, to give the locker room talk. And I'm just going to tell you it was fantastic. That's all you need to know. And But he knew that was the guy who needed to give that message on that day. And it was awesome. So with that, Pete, any last thoughts that you just want to give words of wisdom? I mean, I don't know how it's going to beat the Science Center and the floating ball that's no, spinning never. with yep. everything philosophically. Oh, I don't know. But I will just say, hey, you know, if you got something... Go for it. If not, I just want to thank you for being a part well, of this. Well, yeah, this means so much. I, I love talking about this. And I, I hope if you're, I would just say if, if you're a parent that came across this, I hope it meant something to you. And uh, feel free to find a way to reach out. You can go to the website. I'd love to talk to you about the lessons that I've learned about being a soccer parent and, and the lessons that I'm learning. Still, it's an ongoing process. But uh, man, I'm really proud of you, Phil. This is awesome and in, in what you're doing. And you're a great example and leader as well. So I appreciate you letting me be on your show. Well, thank you, Pete. I look forward to getting this out and having everyone learn from you. And what is, is it? Boltasports.com. Is that right? Bolt. Yeah. Or boltasoccer.com. Okay. Yeah. And if you're ever in the area, please stop by. Would love, would love to meet you. It's down um, south of Nashville and Cool Springs. Well, it was, oh, it was, it was. Now we are, we're dead center oh, downtown Nashville. Okay. That's new information mm -hmm. for me. I'm glad I said something about it right in Nashville. So that's fantastic. A COVID miracle. <laughs> Look them up. That's right. And also with this show, as you know, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can also check it out at HowSoccerExplainsLeadership.com. Share it with others. And you can also, I encourage you, if you want to go deeper on these conversations, join the Facebook group. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram. We'd love to further deepen the conversation there. Share anything that you have, any questions, any articles, any other things that you will know will help us to know how soccer does explain leadership and life and can help us to be better people. And I do hope that you take all that you're learning with this and you use it to help you to understand how you can use soccer to be a better person, to be a better leader, and to flourish in life. Thanks a lot. Have a great week.